Among the papers from the 1970s that I've kept all these years are a few pages of something that I've begun writing about disco. Around the time I wrote them, Guy Hockaden, the founder of the French Gay Liberation Organization, um, FHAR, and the author of, the publisher of Homosexual Desire in 1972, he found them while I was out. In my loft on Chambers Street. And when I returned later, he said to me that such a straightforward description of gay culture was just the sort of thing that gay activists should be writing. Here's what he found. The sun seemed unnaturally bright when we opened the door and walked out onto Lower Broadway. Stephen adjusted the pitch black wraparound sunglasses that he put back on in the lobby. As we walked down Houston Street towards the village, our bodies still gyrated, slowing our walk to a rhythmic amble. Moving at all was slightly painful, and yet felt inevitable as if the music had been absorbed by our muscles, especially the uncontrollable back and forth hip swaying forever. On the way up Bedford Street to 7th, to 7th Avenue, two guys overtook and passed us. When one was right, when one was right next to him, Stephen drew out, drew out under, under his breath in a reverent whisper, disco. He gave it the same whooshing electronic sound as the feedback drone that lingered in our ears, muting the sounds of the early Sunday morning. The two men smiled knowingly. There was no question where all of us were coming from. It was hot tonight, Stephen said. It was really crazy, though. At first, it was like that night at 12 West when we left so early. Creeps everywhere you looked, plaguing you. And you couldn't get into it. The lights were so bright and the music was weird. Then all of a sudden, the music got really hot. They turned off the, those bright lights Everything went red and blue, and everybody was gorgeous. Just big, hot, butch muscle numbers. <laughs> Suddenly, it was a different night. Then, after that real hot set, the music had no beat. Remember, I kept asking you if the music had no beat? I couldn't get into it. And I couldn't tell if Bobby liked it or not, but he kept dancing. He's a little bopper, Bobby. He just bops around. He's hot. <laughs> you discoed good, baby. It was a real good disco. Disco. Stephen's conversation is like that for at least a whole day after some Saturday night disco. A running analysis of the night before, the night that's really morning, beginning about 1 a.m. and lasting until 7 or 8 a.m. Of course, that's not counting the preparation, right? Which begins early Saturday. Getting your disco act together finding a member to go with, eating lots of protein, but early in the day, <laughs> resting up, deciding what drugs to take and what clothes to wear. The clothes are particularly important because apart from wanting, wanting the right look, you have to figure out how much you can comfortably shed or allow to get drenched in sweat without bringing you down. At least until 5.30 when nothing can, at least until about 5.30 when nothing can bring you down. At that point, the music is always good, there's plenty of room on the dance floor, and only the serious discoers left. But best of all, your body has quit resisting. It has unstoppable momentum. That is the one thing about disco compar comparable to any other experience. It's like what happens in distance running or in swimming. You pass a point where you're beyond tired, beyond pain, beyond even thinking about stopping, thinking only that this could go on forever and you'd love it. It's pure ecstasy. Nothing matters but disco, and nothing, not sex, not food, not sleep, nothing is better. The place Stephen and I go had just come, had just come from is called Flamingo. One of the first and most elaborate of the new private dance clubs. Flamingo had been operating for two seasons, that is something of a longevity record for gay discos, which usually only lasts about six months before a new and better place to dance comes along. There are several reasons for Flamingo's staying power. 
One is that Michael Fesco, the owner, has a loyal following among the A-list gay crowd. And Fesco shrewdly closes a club every spring just as the devotees begin to tire of the routine. Most of the flamingos crowd, crowd spend their time, their summer weekends on Fire Island anyway. But more importantly, membership at Flamingo is by invitation only, which guarantees the clubby atmosphere this crowd loves. The feeling that the club is special, exclusive, the best, is essential to a good disco. Membership costs $45 a season. Members pay $5 at the door, and his guests pay $7. What that gets you is juice, soda, coffee, fresh fruit, and stale donuts, which nobody really cares for. There's no liquor, and nobody cares about that at all. What the price of admission really gets you is the most perfect dancing environment yet and the ingredients for that are ever precarious. Flamingo is located in a big anonymous loft on the northeast edge of Soho, where on a Saturday night there's nothing else around. There's no sign in front, not even a lighted door. Going there for the first time feels like an invitation into a secret society. Gay men love the kinds of rituals that make what they do feel seem secret and forbidden as if the whole world wouldn't realize that Flamingo was there from the pulsating of the entire building. In fact, the building houses two discos, the other one is the gallery, and the endless line of cabs pulling up in front, of the min in front from midnight to 6 a.m., New York taxi drivers could tell you a thing or two about forbidden places in New York. You walk through the uninviting entrance into a, into a completely dark foyer, where you can vaguely perceive that there are a few people shuffling around. Then a flashlight lights up and you put your membership card in its beam. You've passed the first test. You go through the doors at the back of the lobby to the stairway. There are two official looking, if a bit stoned, attendants there to check your membership number off in a ledger. Write down the numbers of guests with you, you're allowed two, and write out a bill, $19 for three. You then wait in line to go upstairs. This is the tensest part of the evening because you can hear the music coming from upstairs and they're usually playing one of your favorite songs so you'll know you'll miss dancing to it. At the top of the stairs, which are usually crowded with anxious, whispery guys, you pay your money and get your hand stamped with ink that glows under black light and finally you're in. But still not ready for the dance floor, there's another line at the coat check, which takes forever. Because you have to decide there and then how much to take off, and there's a feverish shuffling of necessities from the pockets of shed clothing to pockets in what you're still wearing, joints of dust, poppers, inhaler, down, cigarettes, matches, coke, coke spoon, <laughs> ethyl chloride if you're a rap queen. If you're smart, you do at home, but that means you're making the difficult decisions before you've got the feel of the place. The next problem is getting into it, but that's not usually severe. Sometimes when you arrive late, the dance floor is so crowded that it's difficult to penetrate, and the energy level is already so high that it's alienating. There are people absolutely wild and ecstatic and completely out of it. The text ends here. At the bottom of a typewritten page, but not quite at the end of a line, so I don't think there's a page missing. I think I just stopped. The next page is the beginning of a brief history of disco. Disco texts are nothing new. They came in during the 1960s when people realized that good dance music was too dependent on studio effects to be reproduced by a live band. They were part of a very brief episode when London, Kings Road, and Chelsea especially, was synonymous with hip. They had names like Anna and Arthur, and later the Electric Surface, the Electric Circus and Hippopotamus. They were private, or at least very exclusive. They were expensive. They were straight. And now, those places belong to bygone days. The new discotheques bear, bear very little resemblance to those places. In fact, they aren't even heirs to that tradition. Flamingo, 12 West, Infinity, The Loft, and Frankenstein are gay. 
Their predecessors are different kinds of places, still in some ways reflected in the new discos. These include the Sanctuary, a late 1960s discotheque in an unused church on 43rd Street, the Firehouse, the headquarters of the Gay Activist Alliance, whose engine house became a dance hall on weekends, and the 10th floor, a, dance, uh, a private juice bar in a West, private juice bar in a West 20s loft. What all of these places had in common are traits of a pariah culture. They were located in out of the way neighborhoods in quickly refurbished spaces with, spaces with the palpable feeling of being susceptible to a bust at any moment. You always knew that their days were numbered, that they would be shut down by the law, burnt down, or just abandoned for a new and better place to dance. And there are a few pages that suggest a more analytical project entitled, excuse me, entitled um, Disco Technologized Pleasure. This begins, I want to describe the disco experience in a way that might convey what is extraordinary about it and also show how it is symptomatic of a wider experience of pleasure in our society. A mode of experience that is both terrifying and overwhelmingly powerful. When I first heard, when I first went to the kind of new kind of discos a few years ago, I was struck by the conformity of the people there. Conformity that goes well beyond the stylistic similarities of people in a demi monde. It was not a question of similar hairstyles or that everyone had the same mustache. The most striking aspect of the similarity was that these people have identical bodies. And these bodies are strikingly different from other bodies. They seem to be honed for a particular activity, maybe the activity is dancing, or what has become known as dancing. These bodies have been made into dancing machines. Place, synthetic 